On May 8, 1945, the Second World War came to an end. The act of military surrender that brought the war to an end was signed a day before. As the news of Nazi Germany's surrender reached the rest of the world, joyous crowds gathered to celebrate in the streets, clutching newspapers that declared victory in Europe and most parts of the world, including the Allies. In the days that followed, many Commonwealth veterans who had fought side by side with the British and American troops would return back to their own home countries to start life all over again, in a world where colonialism still reigned. Some will say the brutalities of war and the many experiences that came with it mentally shaped and conscientized the many African soldiers who had left the shores of the continent to fight in the war. To the many who came back with the hope of a new beginning, little did they know that there was another war brewing, one that would change the narrative, including that of Gold Coast or present-day Ghana. On the 28th of February 1948, in present-day Accra, the capital of Ghana, which at the time was the British colony off the Gold Coast. A protest march by unarmed ex-servicemen who had returned and were agitating for their benefits as veterans of the Second World War was broken up by the colonial police, leaving three leaders of the group dead. Amongst those killed was Sergeant Ajete, who has since been memorialized in Accra. The 28th February incident is considered the last straw that broke the camel's back marking the beginning of the process of the Gold Coast moving towards being the first sub-Saharan nation to break free from the colonial rule, achieving independence and going on to become Ghana on the 6th of March 1957. In January 1948, the king of Accra, Ni Kwabinaboni III, who was also known as Boycott Henny, also known in private life as Kwamela Theodore Taylor, had organized the boycott of all European imports in response to their inflated prices. The boycott's aim was to press the foreign traders known as the Association of African Merchants to reduce the inflated prices of their goods. Bonny stoked the flames that provoked the first truly nationwide anti-British feeling in the then Gold Coast. The boycott was followed by a series of riots in early February 1948. The day that the boycott was scheduled to end, 28th February, coincided with a march by the veterans of the Second World War who had returned to the Gold Coast. The march on that fateful 28th February was a peaceful attempt by former colonial soldiers to bring a petition to Sir Gerland Harlan Creasy, the governor of the Gold Coast at the time, requesting the dispensation of promised pensions and other compensation for their effort during the World War. The ex-servicemen were members of the Gold Coast Regiment, who were amongst one of the most decorated African soldiers, having fought in the Second World War alongside British troops in Burma. They had been promised pensions and jobs after the war. However, when they returned home, jobs were scarce and their pensions were never dispersed. As the group marched towards the governor's residence at Christian Buck Castle in Osu, they were stopped and confronted by the colonial police, who refused to let them pass. The British police superintendent at the time, Colin Herbert Emery, ordered one of his subordinates to shoot at the protesters, but the man did not. Possibly in panic, Imre grabbed the rifle himself and shot at the leaders, killing three former soldiers instantly. The three soldiers were Sergeant Ajete, Corporal Atipo and Private Odate Lamte. Apart from the three fatalities, it is said about a further 60 ex-servicemen were wounded. The popular story told to most people is that the six men who were made up of the pro-independent political group, the United Gold Coast Convention, namely Kwame Nkrumah, Jones William Oforiata, Joseph Kwame Boache Dankwa, Ebenezer Akua J, Obichebi Lamche and Edward Akufado were all arrested following the 1948 strike action because of their fight against the colonial power. The ex-servicemen had prior to this day of the protest been addressed by both Kwame Nkrumah and J.B. Dankwa on 28 February 1948 at Palladium Cinema to show solidarity with their cause. This demonstration however took a violent turn when some of the ex-servicemen were gunned down under the order of Superintendent Colin Imre. This unfortunate incident is known today as the Christianburg Crossroads shootings. The news of the men who had failed angered the rest of the ex-servicemen and the eventual violence that erupted leading to massive looting and destruction of public property in Accra. The looting, demonstration and destruction continued for five more days. On 1st March 1948, the Riot Act was enacted by the colonial government and a state of emergency was declared in Accra. 
On 12 March 1948, a removal order was issued by Governor Creasy for the arrest of the six executive members of the UGCC. This led to the creation of what became the Big Six. The six men were subsequently picked up as being responsible for the riots. From the moment of incarceration, the other five members of the UGCC began to blame Kwame Nkrumah for their arrest. A commission was subsequently set up by the colonial authorities to investigate the riots. The commission of inquiry was chaired by Mr. Aiken Watson. Other members were Dr. Keith Murray, Mr. Andrew Dalgish, Mr. E.G. Hanrot. On the same day, the local political leadership, the United Gold Coast Convention, led by the Big Six, sent a cable to the Secretary of State in London. Part of this cable reads, Unless the colonial government is changed and the new government of the people and their chiefs installed at the centre immediately, the conduct of the masses now completely out of control, with strikes threatened in police headquarters, and rank and file of the police force indifferent to orders of officers, will continue and result in worse violent and irresponsible acts by uncontrolled people. The UGCC also blamed the then governor, Sir Gerald Creasy, for his handling of the country's problems. The UGCC cable further stated, Working Committee United Gold Coast Convention declared they are prepared and ready to take over interim government. We ask in name of oppressed, inarticulate, misruled and misgoverned people and their chiefs that special commissioner be sent out immediately to hand over government to interim government of chief and people and to witness immediate calling of constituent assembly. The unrest in Accra and in other towns and cities would last for five days during which both Asian and European-owned stores and businesses were looted, and more deaths occurred. By 1st March, the governor had declared a state of emergency. The leaders of the UGCC were released a month later. The arrest of the leaders of the UGCC raised the profile of the party around the country and made them national heroes. The Watson Commission report stated that the 1946 constitution was inappropriate from the start because it did not address the concerns of the natives of the Gold Coast. It also recommended that the Gold Coast be allowed to draft its own constitution. A 40-member committee was set up to draft a constitution after that, with six representatives of the UGCC. The governor excluded the so-called radicals, which included Ghana's first prime minister, Kwame Nkrumah, amongst others, from the constitutional drafting committee for fears of drafting a constitution that would demand absolute independence of the colony. By 1949, Kwame Nkrumah had broken away from the UGCC to form the Convention People's Party with the motto self-government now and a campaign of positive action. Nkrumah broke away due to misunderstandings at the leadership front of the UGCC. On 6th of March 1957, the Gold Coast finally achieved its independence and was renamed Ghana, with Nkrumah as its first president. It is said that the attainment of independence by Ghana at the time would usher forth a new ray of hope for many other African countries that hoped to also do the same in the years that followed. The memories of all the dead heroes and the fallen who had given their lives for people to see this day will remain and never be forgotten. Find below in the description box an interview by Superintendent Colin Emery, a colonial royal police officer who gave a harrowing and detailed account of the time in Gold Coast and the riots.